all-time classic bands in freedom. Still this day, those this tunes just rock, and they freaking stand up two time. Herb Thrash here with Radical Russ. We're back, hanging out here in Roller J Studios, and on the line right now, the person, the guilty person who picked that tune and more coming up right now. Founder of Lady Bud Magazine, Diane Fornbacker. Diane, what's going on in Colorado tonight? <laughs> uh. Everything's cool. I hear a little bit of an echo, though, Russ. All right, um, look at that. It's really cold here, but it's not as cold as it was a couple of weeks ago, and it's definitely not as cold as it is out on the East Coast, I hear. Have you gotten used to this? Like, There's got to be a different Colorado, and for those that don't know, Diane moved to Colorado from the East Coast. Is, is there a difference in this coldness and, uh, and um, the culture you know as well? You know what? I actually think that my last winter in New Jersey was worse than mm -hmm. this winter I've experienced in Colorado because of the Arctic freeze that happened last year while we were trying to move. So um, the difference here is everyone thinks that Colorado is just absolutely covered in snow. And while that might be true some days, and you know, it, uh, the thing I like about Colorado, it actually still has seasons. Um, so. You know, it's it gets wintry here, but there are 300 plus days of sun in Colorado. So we have snow, but then it melts away and things get really nice and cleared up um, before the next sort of jaunt of snow comes. So very cool, very cool. Well, Colorado definitely a leading state, legalized back in 2012. Very excited and uh, while we're on it, before we get to uh, Ladybug Magazine and uh, all the good things, uh, normal and everything that you're involved with, just maybe talk about moving to Colorado real quick. And uh, you know, a lot of people these days are some are forced, uh, some choose uh, to move to different states. Uh, I'm actually myself. I chose back in the day to move to California in the mid '90s uh, to be a part of this uh, train. What about you? What what brought you to Colorado? Well, um, the reasons are manifold, really. I moved for a lot of reasons, but the biggest reason I moved was because I wanted to protect my family. Um, because of a lot of my activism and my inability to keep my mouth shut, uh, somehow got CPS sent to my house uh, because my son was talking about, of all things, hemp at school during uh, Earth Day, and they didn't know what that was. So he told him it was like marijuana, but you can't get high from it. So immediately they discounted his contributions to uh, his fellow students about a really industrious and important plant. And they immediately focused on, you know, sort of assuming that I neglected my children, which is ironic considering I was educating him. So I paid attention to him. I um, <laughs> wanted him to have the knowledge to go forth in a new world and a paradigm that in which we find ourselves. And... Uh, that just, I guess, got them sent to my house because I'm a bad parent, I guess. I don't know. Um, but I'm also a patient, and I'm living with complex PTSD, and I use it to, I use cannabis to manage my complex PTSD. And um, as you may or may not know, uh, New Jersey does not have PTSD as a qualifying condition, ironically, um, even though it's a potentially terminal illness for some people. Um, so when you know, I was ready to sort of bide my time for a while and continue to fight for patients and civil liberty-minded individuals uh, in New Jersey. But when CPS almost took my kids, then I kind of had to change course. And it wasn't just me I was, you know, fighting for and other patients. It was the custody of my kids. So, you know, we looked around for a while. We went to Portland, Oregon. You know, I know a lot of people there, and I love it there. Um, and we went to various spots in California that I love. And, you know, we considered uh, Washington. But we ultimately settled on Colorado because the confluence, sort of a house prices, less taxes, legal mm -hmm. cannabis, even though PTSD doesn't qualify here, oddly, either. Um, so the whole confluence between, like, economy, housing, and needing to not escape because uh, I definitely put in my time on the East Coast, so I'm by no means running. I definitely you know, was in the trenches for quite a while. And still, of course, even though I've changed geographical locations, care still very much deeply for the East Coast. Um, I moved here for, I guess, a lot of reasons. 
Yeah, no, nice. I totally understand. And, and, uh, and you have you you definitely have been in the trenches and you've seen uh, th this uh, drug war from the East Coast and uh, from the West Coast. And now you're living uh, there in the in the Midwest, kind of uh, seen it from a whole different perspective. Uh, you've always been an, an activist. You've always uh kind of uh, taking things you mentioned uh, it's hard to uh, maybe keep your mouth shut and I have a, I, th I think I have that same problem uh, you and I <laughs> kind of have a lot of things in common when it comes to that and uh, now you've started uh, Ladybud uh, magazine talk about uh, ladybud.com for a second well, we founded the magazine's parent company, Liberté LLC, in 2012. We were we got our incorporation papers on December 12, 2012, which I thought was a really good date for it. Um, but we launched Ladybud Magazine in April 2013, to very much excitement. Um, and a little bit of background here, um, I have written for High Times Magazine, I'm the Freedom Fighter of January 1999, so I'm dating myself a little bit, but whatever. <laughs> um, you know, and I was also the managing editor of Skunk Magazine. And albeit there are really great things about both of those publications, uh, you know, I still have very many colleagues and friends. And I'm on the normal board with Rick, who's the publishing editor. Um, you know, in working with and for and around High Times and Skunk and, you know, the various other independent magazines and freelancing that I did for, you know, mainstream media and was formerly employed by a mainstream media news outlet early in my career, I still kind of felt like there needed to be another uh, publication which focused more on, you know, interests that I have and people I share a lot more in common with, uh, primarily the fact that I possess the vagina um, and, yeah. <laughs> and then, you know, a lot of women were feeling kind of like, you know, I like this about the magazine, but I don't like that about the magazines um, that were out there. And I kind of felt the same way. And that's not to say I don't respect the place and the work that um, my colleagues and I have also done contributing to those publications, but uh, just really felt like maybe I should, you know, try my hand at it since I had the experience. And I wanted to answer to... Um, my ladies, you know, um, I know there are shades of representation and I really um, would applaud the movement as well as the industry for, you know, understanding that because I have seen it evolve over the course of nearly 20 years. So that is encouraging. But there still wasn't a, a magazine. And, you know, I also incorporate a lot of other progressive issues. So we're not simply a lifestyle magazine with a cannabis activism focus. Uh, we're also talking about other progressive issues like missing First Nations women and trying to encourage people to understand that the laws are so murky um, on, you know, reservations both north of the border and south, you know, uh, but we need to really keep an eye on that. And, you know, a lot of environmental issues. We just uh, recently published a petition to help save some lands from fracking and some people who really need the help getting the word out, you know, because there are these little pockets of people who along pipeline, you know, potential locations um, maybe not know about each other or know how to do social media and typically older and have mortgages and are very busy. So we, we try to help a lot of different causes in addition um, to cannabis reform because we need people to understand that the drug war is huge, yes, but there's another world out there that we have to still interact with. Um, being insular in one cause is not necessarily healthy. Um, you know what I mean? Yeah, no, definitely. You guys have definitely uh, found a niche, and uh, I totally uh, get where uh, Ladybud Magazine is coming from, and we appreciate, like, you know, you guys might come at it from a from a light or a dark. You're not afraid to take on both styles of, of of the story, and you guys might have something strong and something weak, and it's just great to come at it from different aspects. I'll tell you what, let's get to a little bit of music, uh, and we'll come back and get to a few stories on uh, LadybudMagazine.com right now and uh, get a feel. So these next uh, couple choices, uh, Devo, when I saw this freedom choice, you know, you, I've always considered you one of our top freedom fighters. Uh, got about 40 seconds. Talk about Devo, freedom of choice, real sick. Well, I really like this song because he's talking about, you know, what you say you want is freedom of choice, but what you actually are advocating for is freedom from choice. So I really like Devo because they're social critics, but they make it entertaining. You know, if you didn't understand the language, you may kind of understand what they mean, but it's catchy enough that even if you understand what it means, 
even though they're talking about oppression and sort of this dual personality American citizens have with laissez-faire, you know, freedom isn't free, but then not really fighting for it themselves and letting other people do it for them. I really think that Devo is so socially critical in this song, but they make it fun. It's sort of like a silly slap in the face instead of getting punched in the noggin straight up. Outstanding. <laughs> Hanging with Diane Fornbacher. Here's Devo. Turn it up, folks. Yeah.